Jason McCrossan on 106.9 SFM. My guest tonight is an academic and historian who specializes in Chinese and Korean studies, as well as forging a career in the diplomatic service. After Britain and North Korea re-established diplomatic relations in 2000, he was tasked with opening a British embassy in 2001, being its first head from 2001. To 2002. He is Dr. Jim Hoare and he joins me this evening. Good evening, Good Dr. Evening. Hoare. Good evening. To tell the story of North Korea, I suppose we have to really go back to the Second World War. Uh, Korea itself had been annexed by Japan since around about 1910 and it was with their defeat in 1945 that the power struggle between, I suppose, communism and capitalism started. In some ways, you have to go back further than 1945. The Japanese takeover of Korea after 1910 provoked much opposition within Korea itself and amongst Korean communities outside Korea. Then you fast forward a bit to 1945. Japan is defeated, and the United States and the Soviet Union go about working out how they're going to accept the surrender of the defeated powers. It was agreed that the Soviet Union would take the surrender in the north and the Americans would take the surrender in the south. And the division line, drawn on a map by two American colonels, was to be the 38th parallel. It was deemed, it had been deemed, that the Koreans were not capable of self-government and uh, they needed a period of what was called trusteeship. And this was agreed by the foreign ministers of the, the great powers, including Britain and China, as well as the United States and the Soviet Union. And this caused an outrage in Korea, and the Koreans did not want trusteeship. They, were, they thought they were now in free of the Japanese. They wanted to go back to an independent country. The Soviet Union suppressed opposition in its section, and the two sides tried to work for unification. But by then, you've got the Cold War hostilities emerging, and instead of being able to reach agreement, eventually in 1947, the Americans took the whole issue to the United Nations. And the net result was that in 1948, you get Democratic People's Republic of Korea in the North, Republic of Korea in the South. So, I mean, you visited North Korea first time. It was in 1998. And you then went on to open the British Embassy a few years later. What was the first impressions you had when you visited the, the country? I, I was watching a documentary and the documentary makers said that their lasting impression about visiting North Korea was they were more confused about North Korea after visiting it. Yeah, I think that that's a fair comment. It wasn't quite so different as I'd expected it was going to be. It was rather like... China in the 1970s when I'd first gone to China. And away from Pyongyang itself, it was not unlike parts of Japan had been in the 1960s when I first went to Japan. So it wasn't totally unexpected, but I mean, I'd lived in Tokyo, I'd lived in Seoul, and I'd, all of them bustling and full of life and markets and people busily going about their business. And North Korea wasn't like that. It was a sleepy place in the middle of the day, in the middle of the centre of the town. There were very few people about. There was very little traffic. What would those people have been doing? Where would those people have been then? Well, in Pyongyang, they would be working in the ministries uh, and in the industry. And Pyongyang does have some industry. It's mainly light industry now, but it did have heavy industry in the past. In, In many ways, life in North Korea is not unlike life in any other country. Children go to school, people go to work, they come home from work, they eat. They have a modest amount of leisure, much less leisure than we have in the West. So at weekends, they will go out, they'll go into the parks, and they'll sing and they'll dance. A lot of things that people do in North Korea are done as part of a collective rather than as part of an individual or a family group. 
So children don't go out with their family, they go out with their school. And you'll see them marching around at the weekend, or you'll see them being engaged in what they call social work, which means that they read parks and things like that. People generally uh, socialize in public with their families as much as with their work group or their school group or their university group. Away from Pyongyang, life is different. Uh, the cities are probably a bit the same, but don't have the relative luxuries that people have in Pyongyang. Life on the farms is hard and pretty continuous. You don't get many holidays in North Korea. But in, in many ways, people in North Korea are, are just the same as people elsewhere. They worry about what their children are doing in the evening. If their children have a chance to go to university, they worry that they get into the right university. They worry about what will happen if they fall ill and things like that. And when you were there, were you able to have any personal freedom whatsoever? So, for example, could you pop down to the shop if you needed to get something, or was all that controlled? Yes. Well, the number of shops we could actually... We could go into shops, but the number of shops we could actually buy things in was rather limited. I had, curiously enough, more freedom than I'd expected to have. We could drive anywhere in those areas, um, you know, unless it was an actual military camp. You didn't drive into military camps, but you could drive anywhere else, and one was never stopped. The problem would come if you tried to talk to somebody, if you um, made any gesture beyond the simplest of politenesses. You could say, you know, hello, and uh, how are you? But nothing beyond that. Any attempt at conversation it would be immediately stopped. It was remarkable. Somebody would always come up and stop you talking or stop the Korean talking. Um, we didn't do it because it would have only got people into trouble. My successors um, have said, or some of them have said, that they had conversations with people. I suspect it has got looser than it was when I was there. But my own experience was that you didn't really get into conversations except with those who were authorized to talk to you. Do the people in North Korea have any idea about what it's like in the outside world? So, for example, if you were to open up the borders tomorrow, would they know about widescreen televisions and the, t- the things <laughs> that we that we just take for granted? I mean, would they... Would that be a shock to them? Would it be like being transported into the future? Uh, That's a good question. In Pyongyang and some other cities, you see computers being used. We were shown computers in 1998, but nobody seemed to be actually using them. Now they are in use. They don't have access to the internet, but there is a domestic intranet within the country. And they say it's used for things like sending the forecasts to fishermen and things like that. Mobile phones are now quite common. They were banned when we were there. They were then allowed briefly and then stopped. But from 2008, they've been allowed in again. And when I went in 2011, mobile phones were very much in use. Our guides who came with us uh, when we went traveling and and around Pyongyang were using them all the time, um, even right across the country. And if you go to the the sort of places where the the rich or the the children of the elite gather, many of them had mobile phones. Go to the bowling alley and there are people with mobile phones. Televisions, televisions seem generally to be rather old-fashioned, cathode ray tube type things. Mind you, we have a cathode ray type (laughs) television. Um, So I don't know, but... Technology, it is said, is being used to spread ideas. People are getting in uh, memory sticks from South Korea with soap operas on them and other things. Uh, And these are being watched by people and they must have generators to create the electricity required. So for some people, there is a bit more knowledge of the outside world than you might expect. Certainly, the, the, the sort of people I dealt with in Pyongyang, the foreign ministry, the foreign trade ministry, and people like that, many of them did know about the outside world. They saw foreign newspapers. Some of them had permission, clearly, to listen to foreign broadcasts. One said how he preferred listening to the Voice of America rather than the BBC, because although the Voice of America was hostile, it at least carried many stories on the mm-hmm. Korea, where the BBC rarely carried stories on Korea. And that was an interesting comment. Um, we were there at the time of the 2002 World Cup, which was held jointly between Japan and South Korea. They actually showed some of the matches on television, not um, live, but the next day. Some foreign films are quite well known. 
But yeah, I suppose you always run a risk if you're listening to foreign music or listening to a foreign radio broadcast or, or watching a foreign film that these are theoretically things you shouldn't be doing. So you've either got to have enough money to bribe the security people or you've got to have a good lookout system, I should think. Do you think there's much, and this is behind closed doors, do you think they discuss the regime much? Do you think they discuss politics much? Or is there a fear that by doing that, they could be overheard? I mean, it, it, there must be a fear there somewhere. It's a very good question, and, but one that really is very difficult to answer. The wisdom largely derived from people who left the country. People were often inclined to say that they would only trust those who they'd been to school with or some of their immediate family. You didn't trust other people because you didn't know them well enough. You can't be sure that somebody isn't going to report on you. It's now said that people talk more about the political side of things, about the, the regime, about the rulers, than they ever used to, and they can be critical. But I, I accept that this is what people say, but I, to be honest, I never saw any of that myself when I was there. We looked all the time, we looked for signs of dissidence and of and we once saw something scratched on the, gra on the glass of uh, the building. <laughs> All it said was Kim, which wasn't terribly uh, critical or enlightening. <laughs> there seems to be, with the new regime, Kim Jong-un, a desire to replace the current establishment with, with new ones, with, with, with younger ones, ones that are maybe um, more aligned to Kim Jong-un's beliefs and, and thinking. But he seems to be doing it in quite a brutal fashion. It, one of the problems is that we, we don't really get inside the elite and, and know what they're doing, how they're thinking and so on. In the past, people have certainly disappeared. And sometimes quite high-ranking people who fell out with the leadership. Jiang sang um the uncle of Kim Jong-un, who was executed at the end of last year, had twice before fallen from favor and disappeared from the leadership lineups. What he was doing, I don't know, but uh, other people have been sent off to work in the mines or in remote arms. The unusual thing about last December was that it wasn't just that Jiang Sang Tech disappeared from the leadership, but it was all done very publicly, which may be evidence of the new leader's style. You have to go back right into the 1950s and 60s before you come across similar sort of public cases. So it's sort of reverting to an earlier style of putting people up so that you can see that they're falling. There's no pretense that he's all right. This was a very brutal way of getting the message across that I'm the leader. And uh, if you cross me, be careful. And that's the thing, I suppose, again, with North Korea, you're never quite sure wherein lies the truth. There was the the, no. re the reports about Kim Jong-un's uncle, then came that he was thrown in front of dogs and ripped to bits. But then people seem to have been rowing back from that now. We don't... Yes. That's, that report seems to have sort of dropped off now, and, and it's yeah. not, not been... There was... Um, somebody did some research and traced it back to a Chinese satire program. Oh, really? <laughs> Might be true, it might not, I don't know. Uh -huh. um, nothing would surprise me sometimes about what might happen. <laughs> It's 106.9 SFM. A very good evening to you. I'm currently talking to Dr. Jim Hoare. Now, as well as being an author on North Korea, he was also one of the first ambassadors back in 2001. In fact, he set up the ambassador's office back then. Jim, we often think about the regime in terms of just how likely they are to stay in power. I remember when Kim Jong-il, who was the current Kim Jong-un's late father, a lot of people didn't think that Kim Jong-il would have the necessary abilities to remain in power. A lot of people, when he first came into power, thought that that would be the end of the leadership, the end of the regime. I've heard similar things being said about Kim Jong-un. What is your take on his longevity? I remember Kim Jong-il, although people said, oh, he's not going to last and uh, this is the end of the regime. He had actually had 
a good 30 years of training before he took over from his father. The difference now is that you have somebody in charge who has not had that long leadership training, that long leading. He's rather been thrown in very suddenly. But as he's gone for two years, he's gradually begun to assert himself and to, to show that he has views on things. Where it goes, I don't know. I mean, again, you've had people who say, oh, it's all finished. But I think it's changing, but I don't think it's necessarily finished. Despite all the changes that have taken place and the, the relative relaxation that's gone on in some areas, the North Korean state security system is still an extremely powerful organization. And if it could take on Jiang Zhang Tech, who seemed to be at the heart of the system, it can take on anybody. So the regime still has the means of control, at least over those in Pyongyang and those who matter at the top. Um, if you're a North, member of the North Korean elite, you can't just say, oh, well, we can't cope, but let's give up. Because across the, the armistice line is another Korea which claims jurisdiction over the whole peninsula and would come in and take over. Uh, that's the fear, anyway. So they know what would happen if it was the other way around, if it was North Korea taking over South Korea. And so they're pretty careful to make sure that South Korea does not take over North Korea because, you know, the old adage about uh, you hang together or you hang separately. And that's it. They know that they might well hang separately. Mm. That, that, there's a, that's a powerful incentive to keep you working together. Uh, even if you don't always agree with what the leader is doing. And we really don't know. Well, listen, it's uh, been a very interesting conversation. Thank you very much indeed for your time tonight, Dr. Jim Moore. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Bye-bye.